We're reading out of the book of Psalms, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Just for a few moments tonight, we're dealing with the first few words of verse 4. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. As this word goes forth around the world to the various continents, Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to let the anointing of our Savior come upon this vessel to preach this word with love, with mercy, compassion. And as your Bible teaches me in the book of Acts with demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost, and I will give you all of the praise and all the glory in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just for a few moments tonight, we're dealing with the subject, I cried unto the Lord. Our text is found in Psalms chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Uh, I was, our church was founded by Appalachian migrants that came out of the mountains of eastern Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee, West Virginia, came to Cincinnati, northern Kentucky for work. I was raised in a little, we were the poorest church in Kenton County when I was a little boy, and we were Pentecostal by experience. The prophetic word of Joel said, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You're, this is before the coming of the Lord. And we were recipients of that great blessing and still are of the outpouring of the spirit of God. And so I was, uh, I don't know if I ever had a normal childhood. <laughs> uh, Mom said I talked before I was uh, a year, about 10 months old, I was 11, 10 months, I was speak, speaking complete sentences, and she was getting ready to have another baby, and she said, anybody that can talk don't need a diaper and don't need a bottle. <laughs> so I already have suffered, you know. <laughs> so uh, before I was a year old, I was broke of the bottle and the diaper, which probably had some effect on my life. Um, I was by the, my mother would get us in the car and she would start singing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. And she would have each one of us to lead out on it. And it, we learned how to sing harmony. Mom didn't know what she was doing. She was just doing that because she wanted us to sing. So everywhere we went, when we got in the car, we learned harmony. So by the time I was three, uh, I was singing harmony. They would put me at my great grandmother's church up on, the, up on the bench on the piano. My mother would play the flat top guitar and I'd sing the very high tenor with my mother. And this is all I ever knew. All I ever knew was going to the house of God. But at five years old, I'd already sang about Jesus. I'd heard the story how Jesus came to this earth, how he died on the cross. And, uh, but at five years old, I became God conscious. Uh, our church, we bought old oak pews from the Baptist church. They had them stored in a barn and sold them to us for a dollar a piece. They were 100 years old when we got them, and they had cracks in them. And in, those, in that little country church with hardwood floors, naughty pine walls, and a naughty pine ceiling, I don't know exactly what happened. It was a typical old line holiness preacher, wore a white shirt, no tie. He was preaching with all of his heart and Given it, they'd gasp for breath while they was preaching, and we called it hacking. they say, and the Lord said, and I'm coming. I'm, I'm just telling you how it was, all right? I really don't know particularly what he said, but what was ever in that old preacher got on me. And I felt something like I never felt before. I started crying. 
Now, I'd been spanked and I would cry, and I'd get threatened to get spanked and I'd cry. But for this reason, there was no human explanation. Tears were running down my face. I pecked my dad on the shoulder and I said, I need to pray. He said, well, let's pray. I went to the altar and I, I heard repent. I didn't really know quite what to repent of, but I said, I repent. And uh, I became God conscious that night at five years old. And I know it beyond the shadow of a doubt. I was God conscious. The God I'd sung about, heard about, and had Sunday school about, I became God conscious. Our church was very strong in the spirit filled prophetic word of Joel to pray through till you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. So I went on a mission to pray through to the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And somewhere around six years old, maybe a little bit, not seven at this point, because I was still in the first grade. At six years old, about 1030 at night, Alma Richardson was on one side. My mother was up on the platform in what we call the amen corner. She was playing a flat top guitar. Alma had, they all didn't cut their hair, and Alma had very long hair, and she wore it real tight in a, in a, a bun up here, and she wore it so tight her eyebrows stuck straight up. <laughs> and Georgie had long black hair, and she braided it and wore braids around their head. I don't remember too much other than they got to praying for me. In the old days, there were these uh, mothers in the church that felt a necessity. If you came to that altar, they weren't leaving till you were baptized in the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's just the way it was. They knew that that's the power that's going to see this little boy through his teen years, through his college years, and through every year. And they prayed and they prayed. And about that time, the power of God hit Alma. She went to shaking and her long black hair came down. So black hair was flying on me on this way. Georgie went to shout and the power of God moved on her and her braids came loose and they were zooming around like a whip for a while. And, uh, and I, I still was just praying, you know. I knew Georgie and Alma were getting a great blessing. But somewhere around 1030 at night, oh, hallelujah, I fell back in the floor, lost my natural language, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. They picked me up, they put me in the car, and they carried me all home, and I was speaking in tongues all the way home. And I went to, we, uh, in northern Kentucky, a lot of the professional people were German Catholic. So my first grade teacher was German Catholic. She got us all the little children on the floor. And uh, that's how she began every Monday. What happened this weekend? And everybody's hand would go up. I got a puppy. I hit a home run. I went to my grandma's. I did this. And I'm going like that. I got a, a burr haircut. I've got rotten teeth. <laughs> had a mouthful of rotten teeth. Had a burr haircut. And I'm going just like this. And she said, Tommy. What in the world are you so excited about? Her name was Miss Trim now. I said, Miss Trim now, I got the Holy Ghost. She said, you got the Holy what? I said, I got the Holy Ghost. She said, well, where in the world do you get the Holy Ghost? I said, down at the Holiness Church. She said, how do you get it? I said, I don't know. I said, Alma gets on one side and Georgie gets on the other. Alma shouts her hair down. Georgie shouts her braid loose. And you fall back on the floor and you speak in tongues. And she about fell out of her chair. And she looked at me. She said, what in the world is speaking in tongues? I said, Miss Trimnell, I don't really know what it is, but it sounds something like shunana, shunana. At nine years old, I became the piano player at church, and I played. I was the regular piano player. My mom said I was, she was out on the porch, Granny. We got a big old upright from, my Granny got it from Germany, from her grandmother. And it was uh, sitting in the house that we'd given to us. And I went, and Mom was out on the porch, and she said, I said, now Jesus, this after I got baptized the Holy Ghost. I said, now Jesus, they tell me you know everything. And if you know everything, then show me how to play this piano. And uh, mom said, I put my hands on the piano and I played songs and I never did pick around on a piano. I just played it. That's all I can tell you. At nine years old, I became the regular piano player. Now, I'm having a good time. I, we, got, we got a family full, a church full of family, cousins raised up a good time. 
I knew my mother's voice. I knew the voice of Jesus. I knew the voice of the Spirit because I, I became spirit conscious at six years old. But something happened to me at 12 years old. I, I was, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we had an old Cape Cod, Cape Cod house. That's where the upstairs is like an attic. You can only stand up in the middle of it, and the sides of the walls are about 40, 48 inches, you know. And my bedroom was upstairs in that Cape Cod house. I was, I'm a very light sleeper. I've always been that way. I heard footsteps coming up this wood floor. And I thought, why are mom and dad coming up here? And so I had a little lamp next to my twin bed, and I turned the lamp on. The footsteps stopped, but there was no one there. I heard a voice I had never heard in my life. I'd heard people talk about Satan and the devil, but I didn't know too much about him. I never had any conflict, never had any type of of, of confrontation with him. But I remember that this voice spoke out of nowhere, said, I'm going to take your mind. You will die in an institution. You will never marry. You will never have children. I'm going to take your mind. You will not know who you are. You will not know who your parents were. I never heard a voice like that before. It terrified me. I got my little Bible that I'd received for perfect attendance in school. I sat like an Indian on that bed, put my Bible in. I didn't run to my parents. I thought if I tell them that a voice told me that I was going to lose my mind, they would think it's already happening. So I wasn't going to do that. I stayed up all night that night, went to school the next day. Teacher didn't understand my lethargic behavior, threatened to paddle me because I kept on dozing off. The next night was the same thing. I went sound asleep about 2 o'clock in the morning. I heard the same footsteps come up the steps. When I heard the footsteps, I turned on the light. The voice said it again. I'm going to take your mind. You'll never know your parents. You will never marry. You will never have children. They will clothe you and dress you. You will live and you will die in an institution. I, I was terrified. Got my Bible out, opened it up, and I'm just staring in space till the morning sun came up. School the next day, lethargic in school, sleepy, drowsy, getting reprimanded by the teacher. And the third day, my mother had gone to my grandfather's to do some bookkeeping on the family business. My father was out underneath the car doing some mechanical maintenance. My sister was gone with my mother. I was in the kitchen in that Cape Cod house. I can show you the very place it was. There's a porch right off the side of the kitchen. This time the voice didn't come at 2 o'clock in the morning. It came in that kitchen. And the voice spoke to me and said, look out the window. I'm telling you, I heard this not as a loud voice, but in my head, it may as well have been a loud voice. Said, look out the window over at Miss Giles' farm. You see those trees over yonder? The sun is on the top of those trees. When the sun drops over the side of those trees and you don't see the sun anymore, that'll be your last memory on earth. They're going to come and get you in this house. They're going to carry you to an institution. You will never know your parents. You will never be married. You will never have children. They will clothe you. You will live and you will die in an institution. At that point, I became so full of anxiety I screamed out loud. I was losing all control at this point. Still never told a soul. I never told this to anyone until I was 40 years old. And I, I screamed out loud, Who are you? Who are you talking to me? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Who are you talking to me? Leave me alone. And 
And then the enemy put a thought in my mind. He said, you know what happens after high school is over? When the young men have had their football practice, they always come to your road, Mills Road. Or it's hilly in Kentucky. And the young boys like to take their cars and drive them fast and hit the hills and makes their stomach turn. They like to get a high out of driving fast over these hills. That voice spoke to me and said, you know they're going to be coming in just a little bit. You're a fast runner, Tommy. Do you want to die in an institution? You don't have to. You can end this voice. Run as fast as you can. When you see that first car, when it comes over that hill, throw yourself out in front of that car and you'll never have to worry about dying in an institution. And I remember my little mind said, I would rather die under a car than to die in an institution and never know my parents, never know my friends, never know my family, and never have a life. My heart was pounding as hard as it could pound. I remember mom and dad's bedroom was right to the right, just a little country house, a little bedroom. But from the time we were born, my mother's 20 years older than me. She would take us in that bedroom, my sister and I, Vicki. She would begin to pray, and she did that sincere, it's, it's an Appalachian style of praying. I thought that's all it was, but a lot of people prayed that way before. When I got older, I found out. And she would get us in there, and mom would begin to pray. She'd say, oh, God, I know you're going to keep your hand on my children. Oh, Lord, I praise you. She never held back. My mom's a quiet woman until it comes to prayer. And she wasn't screaming at God. She was just pouring out her soul. But it was in a voice to where you could hear it. And we would sit in that room and then mom would get so intense in her prayer that she would begin to stand and wave her hands and she'd say, I know, Lord, as you was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that there's not a fiery trial that you won't see me through. I would see the power of God move on her, and then all at once she'd begin to shake and speak in other tongues. Her beautiful long brown hair would fall down her back, and that's how we looked. And as the enemy, the power of darkness, was trying to destroy a little 12-year-old boy, I looked to the right of me, and another voice spoke. Oh, glory to God. And another voice began to speak to me, and he said, you can have what your mother's got. And I said, you mean the God of my mother can be my God too? I ran into that bedroom. I threw myself over the bed, and I said, help me three times. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I said, help me, help me, help me. And the third time I said, help me. I know some of you watching don't understand speaking in other tongues and you've never experienced it. But I can tell you after the third help me, I lost my natural language. And hallelujah, hallelujah. I began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God would give me the utterance that for 45 minutes I was under the power and the presence of God. My mother came home. I, they never knew what happened that day. I never revealed the intensity of this experience until I was over 40 years old. They said, Mo, we've got a special child. He just comes in the bedroom and he just prays. But they didn't know that this little boy had an encounter, an encounter with Satan himself. And I've come here to tell all of you that are watching on every continent and around the world and in this building tonight, if a little boy at 12 years old can say, help me, help me, help me, there is no excuse for you to hold back because I'm telling you tonight, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. I said you shall be saved. 
So the question is, I cried unto the Lord. I didn't cry to Buddha. I didn't cry to a million and a half Hindu gods. I didn't cry to Scientology. I didn't cry to the religions of this world. The religions of this world are only man's search for God. I didn't have to search for God. He came to me. He found me. I was the one that was lost. I didn't have to search for God. Oh, I cried unto the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. Who is this Lord? He is God the Father. He's God the Son. He's God the Holy Ghost. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This God is so great that from his thumb to his fingertip, the Bible said he measures the span of the universe. He knows where, he knows where Neptune is. He knows the rings around Saturn. He knows where Mars is. It's between his thumb and his fingertip. The Word of God said that the earth is his footstool. Bless his name forevermore. The earth is his footstool. The Bible says he holds the water of the world in the hollow of his hand. That means the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. They're all in the hollow of his hand. What God trying to tell us, that's poetic language, that he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He is all-powerful. That he's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. And I don't know too much about this big God except for what the Bible tells me because the Bible is the revelation of this one God who manifests himself. And the revelation tells me that God in God, he came out of God and he walked with Adam in the cool of the day. That God in God, hallelujah, he came out of God and he spoke to Abraham. That God in God, he came out of God and he had a wrestling match with Jacob. That God in God, hallelujah, he came out of God. Oh yes, he did. And he spoke to Joshua and said, I am the captain and the Lord of hosts. God in God. He came out of God. Yes, he did. And when he came out of God, there were three teenage boys that were thrown into a fiery furnace. Oh, bless his name forevermore. But when that pagan king looked into that fiery furnace, he said, I, taught, I threw three in there, but I see a fourth one, and he looks like the Son of God. Oh, let's give him a shout of praise. Come on, let's give him a shout of praise. Well, this God in God, he came out of God. Oh, yes, he did. He made himself a microscopic DNA molecule. He planted himself in the womb of a little virgin girl by the name of Mary. And inside Mary's womb, he clothed himself with humanity. He got to pick his wardrobe. He said, oh, let me see. Matthew said there's 42 generations. I'll pick my eye color. I'm going to pick my shoe size. I'm going to pick my height. I'm going to pick my skin pigmentation. I'm going to pick my hair color. He clothed himself in humanity. Oh, yes, he did. The Bible said that he is God that was manifest in the flesh. But we didn't see him yet. But he was clothing himself with humanity. But in the city of Bethlehem, oh, bless his name forevermore, out of the bloody flanks of a virgin came the Lord and Savior, and the angels sang, Glory, glory, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Oh, yes, this God, he clothed himself in humanity. He chose to live in Nazareth for 28 years, and in Nazareth, he walked the cobblestone streets. Now, when you preach, you can do whatever you want to with his hair color and eyes. That's okay, but when I see him, he's about eight years old. He's got piercing green eyes, beautiful little 
olive skin, curly black hair, and he's walking the streets of Nazareth, and that's where he's going to live for about 28 years. He's going to live in a poor man's house. He's going to sleep in a poor man's bed. He's going to eat poor man's food. But when he turns 30, on his 30th year of his birthday on this earth, he goes down to the river of Jordan, and John said, there's one coming after me who is mightier than I, whose shoelaces I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. Jesus, he went into the river of Jordan. Oh, yes, he did. And when he came out, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. So the Bible said he was manifest in the flesh, but not just manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. What does that mean? That means that the Holy Ghost confirmed him with signs and wonders. He opened the blinded eyes. He unstopped the deaf ears. He caused the lame to walk. He caused the dead to raise. He walked on the water. Oh, yes, he did. I said he walked on the water. He fed the multitudes with just a little boy's lunch. He was justified in the spirit. And the Bible said this God, he also was seen of angels. That means God. Guarded, to, guarded by angels. There were angels at his conception. There were angels at his birth. There were angels all during his ministry. There were angels at his crucifixion. There were angels at his resurrection. And there were angels at his ascension. Oh, but not only was he manifest in the flesh, not only was he justified in the spirit, not only only was he seen of angels but the Bible said he was preached on to the Gentiles and it says in the book of Philippians that God oh God has highly exalted him and given him a name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Try it. Hallelujah. He was justified in the spirit. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. And the Bible said, hallelujah that he was preached on to the Gentiles. Glory to God. And he was believed on in the world. He was believed on in the world. So when you're talking about this great Jesus, I cried unto the Lord. I didn't cry unto anybody else. I cried unto up from the dead he rose with a mighty triumph from his foes. Come on, let's give him a thanks right now. Hallelujah, I need your Holy Ghost. I said, I need your Holy Ghost. Glory to God. I've been listening to all the words that have been said on all the programming here. And I understand that this particular ministry has a mandate from heaven. And that mandate from heaven is to preach the message of the cross. To preach the message of the cross. And as I begin to meditate on it, I thought about, Lord, it's like in the Old Covenant from Genesis to Malachi, the Tanakh, the Talmudic, and the Mesoretic scribes, they had a mandate from heaven to keep their eye on the holy, infallible, inerrant, eternal word because the Messiah must come by the word. And I thought about this wonderful ministry here. How that the mandate that they've received from heaven is to keep their eye upon that cross and to keep that message of the cross. And as I began to think about those things, hallelujah, the Bible said the preaching of the cross <laughs> to this world is foolishness. Hallelujah. 
You singers, come here. I might need you right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The preaching of the cross to this world is foolish. You know what's foolish to this world? That Jesus paid it all. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. That is foolishness to this world. They don't understand how that Jesus could pay for everything. The Bible said to this world it is foolishness. Say it with me. Jesus paid it all. Come on, say it. Jesus has paid it all. It's too high for me to get it in that key. I want somebody to hit the roof on it. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Do you really believe that? I said, do you really believe that? Do you believe he paid for everything? If you can study your way into it, you can study your way out. If you can shake my hand and get in it, you can shake my hand and get out. If you can take 12 steps and get into it, you can take 12 steps and get out of it. To the world, it doesn't make any sense that this one God came out of God. Hallelujah. And he came, hallelujah. The Bible said he was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was preached on to the nations of the world. He was believed believed on to the world and without controversy great is this mystery and you're looking at somebody right now I have no controversy with this message do you hear me I said there is no controversy with this message cause I know a little 12 year old boy when I cried unto the Lord there was something that happened when I cried unto the Lord something began to happen you'll never make me change you know why it's without controversy Controversy. It's without controversy. Great is this mystery of godliness that my God came to that cross. Let's give God a great clap and a shout of praise. One more time. Jesus do that one more time but this time when they say Jesus paid it all I want you to shout I want you to double your shout right now because the Bible said the preaching of two of the cross to the world is foolishness but to us which are saved anybody saved anybody got your sins under the blood anybody got your name written in the Lamb's book of life anybody once was blind but now you see anybody once was lost but now you found anybody know that you know that you know that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Christ lives in you the mystery of this great gospel that he lives inside of you all oh, getting ready to shout used to teach school I'll give you an A plus on the hand clapping but I'm not going to give you but a C on that shouting I want you to turn your jaw loose turn it loose like you do at a Bengals game or a Cincinnati Reds game turn it loose like you would at a little league ball game turn it loose open up your mouth let the world know one more time hallelujah Psalms chapter 71 and verse 18 said, Lord, let's all stand. Lord, oh Lord, <laughs> oh Lord. I'll get it out in a minute. Woo. When I'm old and I'm gray headed, for until I've shown this generation 
and those to come. Your strength and your power. I'm going to tell you something tonight. The Spirit of God is just so impressed. These words for this generation. I want all those young people. I'm not going to put an age on it. Come on, fill up the front. Or I think you like this side over here. This seems to be the young side. Come on, come quick. I'm used to doing everything fast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.